What is up, everybody? It is your boy, Lou Martinez, a.k.a. Big Chief Burrito, live with you today on a Monday, short week, Thanksgiving holiday coming up. Hope everybody's staying safe or figuring out a good, safe Zoom social distancing situation for Thanksgiving. Or hopefully you've been quarantining for a while and sticking to yourself. If you must absolutely go visit your family and friends, make sure you're safe. And, you know, don't make out with your cousin this year. It's probably not going to be a safe move for you. Uh, today, uh, we got the we got the puppies in the background, as always. I see John's got one in his hands there, too. But uh, we are talking with John Griffin, somebody that I met a, you know, probably about a, a couple of years back, just virtually. I never met him in person. But um, just because he was an artist on Facebook, I sort of became aware of his style, of the types of drawings that he did. I ended up getting uh, this book, a coloring book which is fucking like super, super dope in terms of like, like an adult coloring book. Like I just really liked his kind of sense of style, <clears throat> um, kind of the cool, the cool kind of concepts that he had. I mean, it's kind of like, what is that like? Like, who does that? That's what Hunter S. Turtle type deal right there. I mean, that's dope as hell. Um, and um, yeah, I've, I've talked to him on and off, try to, and then obviously we're trying to promote independent um, artists, whether they're local here or local in other places, but independent artists this year um, as part of my podcast, uh, as part of the video cast um, to sort of tell people, hey, you don't necessarily have to go on Black Friday, Walmart, Amazon, etc. You can buy people a piece of art. Uh, you can make people a piece of art. And so we're going to talk to John about a couple of different things. He also does a Zoom broadcast with some of his pals where they play music uh, and talk about a bunch of stuff. So Without further ado, I want to welcome on Mr. John Griffith to the screen. How are you doing today, man? Howdy. I'm good. How are you? <laughs> After that long-winded introduction, I think we did, you know, like I think the way we met virtually was through, um, I believe, a, a common friend, Pat Hilton. Um, sure. <laughs> and, I, and, I was, uh, and I was looking for somebody to design a logo at some point, and he had tagged you in a post, and I looked at your stuff, and I was like, well, it doesn't really fit what I'm looking for, but... I like it. So uh, from then on, I sort of had you kind of as a contact on the radar there. And then when you did put up uh, that, like the, the drawing book and stuff, I definitely bought one um, because I thought it was like, you know, I'm a collector. I'm a, I'm a big, huge art nerd. Um, and, and so it's kind of, it's cool to have you on, man. Yeah, that's, that's important. I, I was wondering when I was sitting in the green room in there and I was thinking about how did we meet or if we'd met or where you were from? Because, you know, I know you're not from Illinois. That's for sure. That's where I'm from. Yeah. And you live, you're living where now? You're living somewhere in Southern California? Yeah, San Diego. Well, south of San Diego, Chula Vista, but San Diego. That's awesome. That's just, that's awesome. I'm glad that it gets out that, that direction. Pat Hilton is an amazing, is an amazing cat. Um, what an amazing, enthusiastic songwriter, singer, performer. Um, <laughs> no, and... Awesome. No, and it's and it's funny because like I was trying to book Pat because I want to catch up with him and do a pod on based on on all the stuff that he's doing, um, and uh, and then he had been like, yeah, it might be free Monday, and then I was like, oh, I actually, I got, I got, I got somebody that 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 you connected me to that might be uh, coming on on uh, on Monday, so that's kind of weird that that those things kind of got mixed up. The way people connect these days in the world and, and uh, through a musician, he saw me through another musician who I was doing artwork for. And I mean, he hit me up with a message and then somehow you find it. And it's just cool how that all, it all gets connected somehow all the way across the country. Did yeah, you sure. did you always uh, want to be an artist when you were growing up? Or is it one of those things where, you know, you just sort of started developing uh, skills and, and then you sort of said, fuck it, I'm going for it. I was a um, I was a small kid growing up, so I didn't play a lot of sports. And I think I got into artwork as something to do when the other kids were at practice. And I um, I, I drew a lot. My um, my mom would bring me home drawing paper and stuff, so I drew an awful lot. And when I was growing up, but um, I went through school for all kinds of different things. And the dogs got they need their nails trimmed. Um, <laughs> Um, but on, uh, but I drew a lot growing up. I always wanted to be an artist or do art, but I did a lot of other jobs along the way. And I actually worked in advertising for a few years, and that kind of fizzled out. I just decided at that point, about six years ago now, to just start doing it full time and just doing art, just doing the artwork. So cool. that's all I do for full time now. 
the one, how was the, um, what was the, what was the transition point from being able to support yourself fully? Like, what was, was it scary to sort of let go of the nine to five or how did you deal with that process? I was doing, I was doing my art job that I'm doing now while I was doing a job. I had a real slow advertising job and I sat at a desk all day and I drew pictures and the pictures turned into posters for, for when to them for bands I liked originally and it turned into bands I looked up to and that turned into bands that just needed artwork and that just became the thing that I did for a long time was just make posters. I did that for a long time at the other job. Now, so I had to kind of grow that business inside of the other business. And the other business was, 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 uh, you know, going away, was getting smaller. And uh, my, my posters were getting bigger. So when it finally came down to, they didn't need me anymore at the advertising job. I just jumped off and started drawing and putting a little more, a little more point myself directly into it. You know, this is, this is Phoebe. Oh, hey. she's having a weird day. <laughs> She didn't know whether to hug you or scratch you right there when you picked her up. Yeah, she's <laughs> right now. She's it's okay. <laughs> Pay your pen. Um, your no, I, I had talked to um, a friend of mine, um, Keithan, who's a featured artist at Comic Con, and he sort of had a, a similar sort of experience where, you know, you're in this sort of corporate world or semi corporate, I guess, if you're doing drawings for for bands and stuff like that. Uh, but it's you know that transition of moving to fully doing something that you love um had to be at least fulfilling right when you when you finally oh, yeah. just stopped that and i was before i did before i did my poster thing i mean the poster thing started off mostly small bands up to you know touring bands but the advertising job i was working for nascar i did like stuff for the nascar races and the and the, the big giant art that went down on the um is this some of your poster work yeah those are all posters those are all some posters i did for a, a installation recently um but I, so I, I, was, I worked for big corporate before that, and it was okay. I mean, it was great, but the, the work was just slow and not interesting, and definitely wasn't creative work. It was just repetitive work. You know, when you create something for somebody who already has knows what they're going to do, you got to do what they want. And I got it, doing my own thing. It became way more fun to just to do what I wanted to do and have people like it, and then use it for what they could, you know, they could benefit from. So many, so many concert posters. There's a lot. Yeah, that's just a small selection in that image there of um, some ones I picked out for installation. No, when in, in, in film work, like there's people that collaborate with each other all the time. And, and basically, I always see it as a difference between collaborating and then also trying to get somebody to work for you for free. For example, if a buddy of yours was like, hey, you know, I'm thinking about doing an event and and, um, you know, we're friends. I want you to help me with the poster. I, I would assume that there's there's a difference between. All right, I'm gonna give you a homie price, and I'll do a, and I'll do whatever you want as a hired worker. Versus, okay, this is something I believe in. I will collaborate with you, but you gotta let me sort of do what I feel. Do you do you see that line in terms of between collaboration and just, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah, I like that approach. I like that 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 take on collaboration. I like that. Um, um, I, you know, every, every job is different. Every job is individual to the person who, who, what, what they want, what they're doing. If there's some, you know, there's some cat that's playing guitar in a bar by himself on the woods, you know, back before the COVID, of course, you know, but doing real small gigs, doing nothing, doing, doing his best just to get, you know, his name out there. I want to help him out right away, do whatever I can for him, you know, and then I have other bigger acts that come along and I never get too, too expensive, but you have, you have to hire them for a little bit higher price so you can relate to their other people they're working with. But, I, I like collaborations, though. That, and if anybody comes along with an idea that I really believe in or that, that I want to be part of, it might just happen without their, their even knowing. And then all of a sudden, it's all done, and here you go, you know, I, I, without, without asking for anything. Um, it, it just kind of depends on the job and the person and the, and the event and what, what it stands for, you know. And uh, it, depending on that is obviously you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna make that decision about, you know, how deep or how much of you are you going to extend in there, right? Yeah, sometimes. I know, that's kind of random, too. It's about the ideas. Some of the ideas are, are super fun to work on, and I want to get into them and go crazy. And some of the ideas that people come up with are are not as exciting for me, and so that they, they become more more tedious. Um, yeah. I try, I try to maintain what I, whatever I do. I try to always I always tell them, you know, if you want something, probably the same thing I told you is like I'll do something, but it's going to be like um, in my style eventually. No matter what I do, I can't paint like yeah. a so I can't do it in the yeah. work, you know, necessarily. I can I can design some things around you know ideas, but. It's always going to come out looking like something I made in the long run, I think. Yeah. No, absolutely. I think one of the things, that, if I remember from a long time ago, is like, you know, an, an, you can 
just because somebody's an artist, you know, um, like they say, hey, draw me a clown. Well, I'll draw you what my interpretation of a clown is or what a clown, a clown means to me. But as far as getting technical with it and being able to, uh, you know, just give you exactly the, the, the exact clown that you want, that's going to be difficult. You know, every artist is going to have their own take, right? There's, there's, yeah. then that's the difference, I guess, between like technical skill and I guess expressionist skill, right? Oh, yeah, sure. I think, well, and, and, and man, it could be a clown, it could be a bird, it could be anything. It could be like a, a, a seahorse that lives on land that wears a, a oxygen or like a water tank instead of an oxygen tank but he lives on land i've had the most weirdest like everybody can come with any ideas that they want to come up with and i'll try and create it for them and most of the time it works out sometimes it does and sometimes it does it's funny I, you know i don't know no i've had that happen where people are like hey you know and 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 i'm always cognizant of actors that have worked for me for free like I told you, you know, I've had editors and, and cinematographers that, that just work, jump on my projects because they like what I'm doing. And then, you know, like I said, I had somebody that was a longtime collaborator that always was down to work with me. And I was like, I need uh, a design made for my intros and stuff. I need I want to pay you. I, I, I uh, And he's like, OK, I'm going to treat you like a regular client. And I, and I told him exactly what I wanted. And, and he's like, boom, he did it you know, versus people that are like, hey, I've worked with you for free. Can you help me? Can you take a look at my script? Absolutely. Can you help me edit this trailer for my movie? I'm like, okay, I will help you edit the trailer for your movie, but you're asking me to collaborate with you, meaning you want my style and I'm going to look at the footage that you have and I'm going to pick something that you've done. You know, I don't want you to, I just, I'm not going to send you a cut and you're like, uh, well, I wanted to start with this and then five frames of this. And then I want to use this song and then this. And then I'm like, well, now you're just asking me to work for free, not collaborate. Yeah. Yeah. There's a difference. That's for sure. <laughs> well, that's a difference. You know, I, for a long time, I, for a long time, I was able to do a lot of trading for my arcs. I really wasn't at the beginning. I was working. I was working that advertising job. So I wasn't worried about making a lot of money off of it. And not every artist has that luxury to be able to do a lot of work without having to worry about that for a while. The first year, I probably gave away half of everything I made, and everything else I was selling for like on, on Fiverr or something. You know, I wasn't doing anything. I wasn't trying to make money off of it. I still don't really, and it just, just to, to pay the bills. But um, and if, if you really want to do it, you'll do you'll do as much of it as you can for free, in a sense. I mean, yeah, it, it just it, 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 the way to get established with with art like what I do. It was the best way to do it was to do a lot of it, you know, really cheap at the beginning and. and if you're going to create art and you're going to put your art in the world, you can't just jump out in the world and say that it's worth what it, you know, what, you know, Harrison Ford's artwork is worth or whatever, you know, or somebody up here, wherever. But um, I, you know, I had to build all that for a long time where anybody to think that anybody in the Southern California would know who I am. First of all, that, that's awesome. You know, that, that, but that was all just marketing of like from, from job to job and, and just, I'm going to draw another picture tomorrow. I'm going to draw another picture. I might draw two pictures tomorrow. What am I going to do with those pictures? You know, I might as well go do something with them and put them out into the world of music and see how it, you know, see how it feeds me back. And they all came back and they all take good care of me. My kitty yeah, really yeah. right here. Yeah. <laughs> um, what? Um, so, so you start, you, you start working, you start, you know, drawing a lot as a kid and stuff like that. Do you, do you sort of try out a lot of different um, mediums before you settle on what you're doing now? Like, do you go from paper? Do you, you know, oils, acrylics? What's what? What's what's the process of, of settling on kind of what your style is now? I just, for along the way, it was just whatever was around, you know? Maybe when I was a kid, I had watercolors and pencils, and, and then as I grew older, I put all that away. I did clay for a few years. I've always tried to just do something creative in my life, whatever it is now where I'm at now is because well, I was doing all the drawings. I drew, I draw every day anyway. So the drawings were, became the posters and that became me traveling to the events where these posters were used. Kind of a little roundabout story, but it'll get there. And then, then they were like, well, why don't you come set up and sell some posters? Well, then I'm setting up and selling posters at the events, but I'm bored. because I'm sitting in the booth all day. So I start painting while I'm at the events. And then the paintings turned into, well, now I'm going to have paintings and stuff. And then, so I'm just kind of doing the stuff. So I'm traveling around the painting for, are a good, um, are, are, you know, I draw a lot for the posters and design, but then the, the paintings are a good escape from all that rigidity of the design. So I go back and forth. And then, I don't know, I don't really, I, I focus on, lately I've been focused on the painting more because I've been, I've been home in the studio a lot. 
and it seems like it's been taking pretty good care of me for for this season anyway. Are you using acrylics now, or what are you using on your current paint? Acrylics, yeah. My, I have very little, very little access to. Well, I have oils. I just I've had very little experience with them. And when I'm traveling and painting, doing live art, acrylic is just so much better because it's it's immediately dry and it just happens so fast. You can work with it. I know how to layer it. Um, I get a lot of different effects from my from my acrylics. Those people are, are convinced at times that they are oils or watercolors, depending on how I, which direction I take them in. Um, I just use a lot of paint. Is what it comes down to. <laughs> No, but, the, and, and, and not being, you know, and nothing, <clears throat> not being afraid of like of um, of just you know doing it, and I, I don't put a whole lot of planning into anything I'm doing in the art. And well, sometimes in the portraits, I might do a little bit of sketch first, but most of it's just like let's just do it. I can sit there, you can ruminate on a painting for a long time, or you can just jump into it. And so a lot of my, my a lot of my learning about my progression of what I'm doing in my painting, it kind of happens as I'm going. I'll do a piece, do another piece, and it'll change. Each piece changes me a little bit to where I end up here. I can't explain it. I don't know. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I've seen you do your, your live painting streams and it doesn't seem like you start like sketching out the page and just like getting your point. You just kind of, you just kind of go with it. I used to get all worried. I did a couple of live, big live shows where I get real worried and I come to the design, the idea and the image and have pictures I printed out, know what I was going to do, get the canvas there and do it and then just be disappointed in it. It was like it worked the whole time. It didn't turn out like I thought it was going to. And then I just kind of started one day just like, just take the canvas. They're only the canvas is only a few dollars a piece, and then throw them up there and just start painting and see what happens. And no planning. And most of the times, if I do the live performances, the live um, live painting stuff I've been doing, it's just like let's just I kind of have an idea. Let's just see what happens. And I paint it. And you, at that at that point, you don't you don't have any any chance to really, you know, it's going to have to turn out good because you're doing it in front of people, I guess, in a way. So you have to. It's a performance. But you, it may. I don't know. It's weird. I've just had luck with them turning out the way I like to have them turn out. I guess. Now, do you get any shit from artists where they tell you, man, real artists stretch their own canvas? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I get that. I get that. When I, I, I share a picture of a whole bunch of canvas I bought the other day at, at, the, at my last minute run, run out to the art store. And um, they're all around the whole rooms, like they're stacked in every corner of the room. But I yeah, just, I can't, I don't think I can, I'm not a woodworker. Uh -huh. And I'm not like the craftsman on that on that point of the angle and if, if some you know if somebody else wants to come along and stretch my canvases that'd be great but i'm gonna be painting the whole time and if i can be, be, just be painting and go from canvas to canvas and they're already stretched they're already out there i'm supporting somebody somewhere i suppose um again i, I just have i think I'm, I'm i don't wanna i don't know i don't have time to stop and stretch the canvas i guess is that if that's the i'm just totally no yeah that's fine i mean myself. no i mean i i, I i'm um that's why I have to say to them, I guess, if it comes down to them saying something like, eh, you know, they get. No, no, I mean, that's. I, that's just... I don't have a lot of traditional styles as far as like, I'm not a traditionally trained artist. I don't have the, the knowledge of even how to You work with oil paints, really. I just, this has all been experimental. All this stuff has been experimental. And, and once you start to work with something and it feels good, then you continue and, and, and you evolve without trying because you learn as you go. Um, but I haven't. Um, I haven't, I haven't got a whole lot of educational training in art other than my, I grew up my mom doing it. I took a few art classes, never had an art teacher grab me and say, oh, you're the one, you know, but I was just always making art. I'm not going to stop. No, that, that, like, I, I, I always loved painting. I always loved art growing up and, and, and it was always a passion of mine. Like in a, in an alternate world, I would, I would make long form documentaries and, uh, and just paint all day. But but yeah, sometimes the whole you have to you have to stretch your own canvas, and then you got to use the yeso, and then you got to mix your oil paints and do this and that. I'm like, man, I just want to paint. Just yeah. give me some acrylics and a piece of metal. Let me go at it. You know, I paint on doors and walls and things, and there is definitely you know there's definitely something to be said about someone who can get their who can stretch their own canvas and produce their own pigments and everything and do it all. I understand that. I really do respect that. I don't think I'm, I, I don't know that I'm, I guess I just don't take it that seriously. I don't know. I just want to, I want to, I want to have fun and create these images and they, they, they are, everything's is done correctly as far as, I mean, the canvases are prepared correctly and I'm using the right paints, things like that. But as far as the other part of it, the, the production and the, and the yeah, construction yeah. of all of it, I'm just yeah. not funny. No, I got all, the other, all the other ideas I want to do and stuff that I work on and, and, and things that I want, you know, so it's hard to, I'm barely focused into painting. So I have to be careful not to focus on anything else. Got it. We're talking with John Griffin live here on a Monday on Fireside Chat with Big Chief Burrito. You can follow him at uh, at John Griffin Art. That's on Instagram. Kind of keep track. And also on Facebook, you can go on facebook.com slash John Griffin Art 
and you can check out uh, some of his work. Thank you, everybody, for watching the stream and for catching us live. To make sure that you never miss a stream and an interview, make sure you follow us on Facebook.com slash 2 Burrito. On Twitch as well as twitch.tv slash 2am burrito, youtube.com 2am burrito. You know, you notice a theme there, the burrito theme. Uh, and, uh, and, and, I, and, uh, and obviously, um, we're going to, we're going to talk a little bit more about some, uh, so in terms of influences and stuff like that, if you, if anybody has any art related questions for John about his process, anything else, uh, go ahead and drop it in the comments. Make sure you like the stream. Let us know how you're feeling today. How artistic are you today on a Monday? Are you going to create some art over this Thanksgiving weekend? Um, but John, any major like okay? So you start you start you don't take a lot of acting uh, art classes. You you know your mom gives you some paper. I'm assuming you're starting on like newsprint or something so that you know you can draw a bunch of stuff. But when you start getting deeper into the art world, realizing that it is something that you have a proclivity for that you love. Do you then start seeing artists or recognizing artists that have been around and then you start saying like, oh, I can kind of see how my stuff is similar to them or this or that. Or do you start later on finding influences? Yeah, everywhere. I've always had different influences that pushed me along that I didn't think as much were influenced. Everyone from Dr. Seuss to Del Silverstein up to, you know, my mom got me a Picasso when I was a kid. So Picasso was turned on, turned on to him right away when I was really young. Um, Salvador Dali, of course. But then I always seem to find, I tend to find my influences in people that I meet wherever I, wherever I go. If I go, um, if I, if I lived in Arizona for a while, I lived in California for a while. I've always, I've always run with these different crews of people. And um, everywhere I, where I would live, there would always be one or two people that would be stand out as other artists that I was producing artwork. And I think that those guys end up being the biggest influences on me along the way, watching other artists work and getting excited about what they do, knowing that I'm doing something different, but we're both kind of have the same energy of, of the drive that moves forward. Um, so a lot of my, my major, my, a lot of my influences along the way, and I like, I, I, I love like all the artists through history. And I watch all the documentaries. I pay attention to all these different ideas. Um, but the biggest influence has always been people that I see doing art and that I see making art in the world right now that are, are just, some of them are just prolific and they just blow my mind and it makes you want to work harder. And I think that's what artists, we as artists feed off each other. And there's not, only, there's not a whole lot of those people in any community you go to, there's only a few. You'll, you'll meet that are on that level, I think. Sorry, go ahead. Speaking no. of burrito, I think your, your burrito just gets Yeah, my, my burrito got delivered. It's all right. I got a, <laughs> got a toaster oven. I'll pop that baby in there. Uh, <laughs> So this is my this is the stuff that I used to do back in the day, which was kind of some like real intricate like uh, like where I would pick a drawing type still and then just kind of fill it out to sort of make try to make the image disappear and stuff. I did. I was always into these little sort of small uh, little little intricate little pieces of art. I actually exhibited at the San Diego Art Institute a couple of times, and I did the thing where I was trying to draw and stuff have a little thing outside and draw and, and things like that but i realized i didn't have the i didn't have the ability to continue doing the same style over and over so like i, I like i did one huge drawing that's up on my wall now that that's just in that little style and then i started trying to kind of be like all right well if i just do a bunch of these i'll be a famous artist and i'll be able to just you know but that's something that people don't realize that that and that that for in general, for an artist to become famous and appreciated by by the art world, you almost have to keep painting in the same style past the point where it's something that's passionate for you, right? Oh yeah, oh yeah, that's a that's a good quote right there from the, the Basquiat movie where he talks about if you want to be famous, you got to paint something that everybody loves, and then you got to keep painting it for the rest of your life. That's like yeah. my top. That's like my top number one movie of all time, actually. It's, it's, it's the best movie, one of the best movies ever made. For sure. As for me as an artist, who doesn't look out and see, he's one of my biggest influences too. Not even like the art that he made, but just to do there again, his drive, his creativity, his uh, ability to, to, to do that, you know. Um, Sorry. He's just okay. show and tell my Warhol yeah. my Warhol versus Basquiat print. Yeah, that's nice. Um, I, but, but those but there again, it wasn't even about the art that he was creating necessarily, but like Andy Warhol and Keith Haring and, and Basquiat what there was their drive it was that that that, that push they had where they just had to keep creating this artwork you know and, and then if you don't have that drive you won't you won't make a lot of artwork you know so there's some great artists that don't have that drive so they just don't create but then there's some people that seem to be driven you know like that that are that that I know, that's how i feel i am anyway just driven to more, make more and more and more 
something. It's crazy. There's a big stack of drawings right here. I, I don't know what the heck's going on. <laughs> I actually saw Keith Haring. Oh, that's that's dope. I saw Keith Haring when I was a little kid coming off the subway in New York a long time ago, and I didn't even realize who I who I was seeing until like twenty years later. So yeah, that's. Yeah. But, well, I, I didn't. I didn't. When I first saw his artwork in the '80s or whatever, when I was a kid, I didn't understand it necessarily. So I didn't. I didn't. You know, it didn't, it didn't pick up on it. Um, but we'll go back and watch one of his documentaries about how he got his start and his crew that he ran with and how they and how he just pushed himself and pushed himself until finally somebody noticed what he was doing. And given most of those artists were in like places like New York City or Seattle or or San Diego or places like that, and I'm sitting in the middle of Illinois where there ain't nothing but corn around me for a hundred miles, brother. <laughs> and that's and he, he's another guy that would go to Germany to do a mural and would have this 80 foot wall that he had to paint and would not would not sketch would not sketch out a drawing would not plan yeah, it would yeah. just start yeah. painting and then end up somewhere right right and he was happy in his style like then think about Keith Haring's style it didn't change I no. mean no matter how different or the the theme was it was always those characters and those lines you know and that's that's good he could do it you know. Um, I've always I've changed a lot throughout the years. I've gone from painting pictures of Jimi Hendrix to painting, you know, people's dogs to painting trees to painting gardens to painting flowers to painting, you know, like. I, but I, I I think the state my style doesn't change so quickly as I go that you lose track of who I am. I think it. I think that people can are paying attention. They'll see that I went, I spent I paint like this for a while, and then it kind of evolves into something else. And all of a sudden, I'm painting something completely different. You know, if you saw me uh, two or three years ago set up, it would have been all, you know, like celebrity faces and stuff. But I got so tired of doing that. Those are all gone. And now it's trees and mountains and houses and stuff like that, you know. Is this uh, due to your uh, your Cubs allegiance that you make this? No, actually, I'm a Cardinals fan. Oh, you're a Cardinals fan. <laughs> wow. Yeah, he, he was for the Cardinals before he was for the Cubs. But I'm a more. it's more about the baseball. That was about baseball that, that happened. Um, uh, yeah, there's Salvador. Um, but the 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 Cubs Cardinals thing that's me and my friends that's just what we do right here that's it's, you know baseball is exciting so you got a Montreal hat on so it's you know it's each to each their own you know what I'm saying and you're in San Diego so go figure. Yeah, well, I'm a Mets fan but I, but this has always been my, one of my favorite baseball hats of all time. I like that hat. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah it's, it's 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 an incredible hat. Um, no, I, I do like you know like I said portraits to just whatever and then lately it's been these fl these flower pieces and stuff and floral stuff and trees and. Bill Murray, or just what, and sometimes it's what people bring to me. I, I do a lot of custom work for people. Obviously, I do. I paint dogs all the time. But I paint dogs and houses and grandmas and things like that, babies, whatever. So, other than like the the pop art '80s, um, if you could go back and paint in any time frame, do you think that you'd go back to like to help like with the Sistine Chapel? Would you want to hang out more with like uh, Jackson Pollock, Picasso, Salvador? What what is what? Uh, what what would be the time frame that you'd be like? Put me some. Put me here. So my go-to would be Van Gogh, but I sure as hell wouldn't want to live in that time. So probably not him. Yeah. Um, but I would like to see his his. Yeah, I would like to, there again an artist that was driven and, and crazy, um, but but amazing. And what came out what comes out of that driven is just is is unbelievable, or unimaginable. Um, oh, I don't know. I'd like to see Salvador Dali. Be fun to hang out for a little bit. But then again, I would like to see some of the artists that I don't live around anymore. The people that are that were working that I that I work with. You know, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm lucky to know a lot of artists that are working right now that are working artists that are doing stuff. And it's exciting to get together and talk to them and work with them. Go to a time period. I don't know. That's tricky. Michelangelo, maybe. But then I don't it's too religious. That time period is too, too restrictive on the brain. I don't know. That's a tricky one. Yeah, I don't know. I don't Picasso, know were... maybe. Picasso was an asshole, even though they say he never was called an asshole, but he was, you know, so that, that's tricky, too, you know. I was um, I was lucky growing up in New York in the 90s where um, I would take advantage of the uh, museums because they even though, you know, you want to go to MoMA or you wanted to go to uh, whatnot, you know, they would charge tourists like 18, 20 bucks to, to go in. Uh, they The museums in New York have a rule that you have to have a certain time of the week that's for locals where they charge nothing or like a quarter to go in. So I would go to the I would go to the MoMA on Thursdays from like five thirty to seven thirty because that's when you could go in for free. And I'd go to this this museum, Guggenheim, on Tuesdays or Wednesdays. So I got a I got a chance during like during that time to see gigantic Keith Keith Haring exhibitions, Basquiat exhibitions, you know, pop art stuff, Picasso stuff. You know, I'd I'd go and sit and stare at the four ladies at the at the MoMA for like 20, 30 minutes. And just sit there and just sort of absorb it all. So, 
I, I, I got lucky in that era in that to be like a New York art kid in that time. And it just sort of always stuck with me. And then I started learning about all these artists that I didn't know about Basquiat and all this stuff and, and kind of going down that rabbit hole. But, but it, but you're right right now, there's a ton of artists that are, that are out there doing a lot of incredible stuff in different mediums. And then we can't forget about the, the goat, which is, no, this uh, guy. <laughs> you can't see anything on the wall right there. Uh, not that one, but another one. Um, yeah, it's funny, you know, and it's it's and those artists that like, we remember like that during those times, there were lots of artists too. During the time of Basquiat, the time of Warhol, and the time of the guys, there was tons of artists doing stuff. But for some reason, history remembers those few names that stood out, you know, and you don't know what's going to happen right now, and all the artists that are working, who will be remembered or not remembered or what will what'll stick around, what won't stick around. I think as an artist, you think about that as you're creating, like what will become of this stuff I'm creating? You know, will, will it be remembered? Will it, will, you know, will it be in a closet somewhere? Who knows what will happen over time? You never um, tell yourself that line from Basquiat, your audience hasn't even been born yet. Yeah, you might be looking at Van Gogh's ear. You know, that's the whole thing. That movie gets inspiring. If I'm ever having a down block time where I'm not working and then I, that movie just, it, it like kicks me in the ass. It makes me want to work. You know, I, I I give it because of his drive, but also because of his short life he lived too, and he only had a minute. The freezing twenty seven club, the poor bastard. And, um, yeah, no, no, yeah, absolutely. I mean, but you know, he was he got he was yeah, with he was I would with go my, back to the, that time period. I'd, I'd jump in with that five Frey and those guys and hang out, and I just for, I'd be I hopefully be there that morning and you know, keep the dude alive or something. If I got a chance to go back, I guess because he has one of my favorites. And, and again, it's not even the art that he produced as much as the. Just the, the drive and the production that he that he, that he, that he did, you know how he did it. I got I, my I got my, uh, my my Basquiat crown right there, <laughs> my same old crown. Um, but you know, and then also the thing the thing that people say about art and 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 that that sort of gets criticized and it sort of carries over into the film world is that you know Picasso was obviously groundbreaking and 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 he created this brand new style, but you know, the same way you could say Martin Martin Cassese created a style of movie or, or something like that. And and what I do in a lot of my films, because I've seen a ton of films, is I, I, I create homages or, you know, I mirror things that I see, trying to give it my own style. But it's impossible not to use the language of cinema that you've grown up and loved um, to create your own art, to create your own films. The same way that as an artist, you know, just because you know, Picasso was one of a kind doesn't mean that you can attempt like a cubist style drawing and try to find that style in of yourself, right? There's, do you see that sort of thin line between like, you know, where, where I think people get a lot of shit. They're like, well, you're just trying to be Picasso or you're just trying to be Salvador Dali. Like there's up there, you can take some, you can say, damn, this guy figured this out. I want to take it a step further, right? I think everybody's trying to be somebody else. There ain't nothing I make that I didn't see somebody else do first. I didn't experience some way or another. I may have combined different elements to make what I do, but it's all came from other people. I see. I'm trying to be Scramble Campbell. I want to go paint live in music shows and rock and rock that, you know. And um, and I'm lucky to be able to do that sometimes, you know. And and I think I think it's important that one of my my biggest pet peeves in the whole industry of creativity is copyright. Because copyright's great, and sure, it, it makes sure the person who comes up with the idea makes the money. But the idea that you can't use that idea and, and tweak it to another idea, I be that sampling or whatever it is, you know, it's copyright infringes upon the advancement of creativity because it just makes people stop and try. I mean, I guess it forces us to create our own thing if we have to. But I feel like that we should be collaborating more. I see that we're going back to collaboration because I think we should be collaborating more with our ideas and not saying that's my idea. You can't use that to advance your idea. You know, because that's kind of what people say when they when they when they when they put a hard copyright on something, they say this is my idea and you can't do it. You know, and 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 that's good, I guess. I you know it protects them in their in a way, but it, it is in a, in a in a creative outlook of the whole thing instead of a, a you know corporate outlook. I think it, it hurts the it hurts our advancement a little bit. You know, because I mean that's what a lot of those guys. You know, that's what Andy Warhol was doing. He was copying, but he was making us look at what he was copying. He wasn't just copying it to copy it. He was copying and saying, hey, look at this. This is what exists. And that, that stuff doesn't exist anymore. So now you look back at his work, which seems so benign and weird when he was making it. But it's cool now. It's vintage. It reminds you of a time period. You know, those cans don't even really look like that anymore for the most part. But 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then yeah, like uh, I know that for example, like like something like this, you you could look at something like this is something I got at Comic Con a couple of years ago, but it's just uh, a bunch of different. Mar- obviously, you can take a look at. Obviously, you can look at that as one of two ways. It's like, oh, he's copying this and this and that, or you can be like, oh man, that's a cool take on that, right? Andy Warhol created a style that turned into a, a movement. So you, if you, I mean. It's it's there again. It's just an idea, you know. It's the first guy who painted a, pa- a painting. The second guy who painted a painting saw the other guy paint the painting. So it's like you know you can't. Yeah. Everything everything's gonna gonna come backwards that way. I if think you want to go, if you, go ahead. As long as you don't step on somebody's toes and use their idea to try you know to intentionally make a ton of money off of it, you know. I mean, that, there's 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 ways about that. I'm not saying you should go out and take somebody's idea and use it for your and make money, but but the idea that you can take their idea and advance yourself with it, you know. No, there's mm-hmm. plenty of people that are that are taking other people's jokes, drawing stuff like that from the internet, and then repurposing it as their own to make money. That's that's being an asshole. Or how but, about not just to not be creative? How about let's just share yeah. memes all day that somebody else, some one guy made in some office somewhere, yeah, and then yeah. we're going to share those memes for the rest of our lives. No offense if you do, I don't care. But but the idea is that that's a, such a huge outlet of our social media that's not very creative. And sharing is uh, good. I like to share. Don't yeah. get me wrong. But the idea that they're not creating new ideas, they're just putting the idea they just saw right in front of your face with somebody else. I don't know. There's a, I could go around and, lo- and loops for that one probably for a while. But Well, no, yeah. And if you want to get to it, like if then we're all basically copying the first guy that, you know, that drew a deer because he was high as hell inside his cave like okay, 40,000, okay. you know, 40,000 years ago. He ate some fucking, some, some, some mushrooms off the ground, got high as hell, saw space aliens. And said, "Oh, I'm gonna draw this deer that I killed today on this wall." And you know, the other guy was sitting there like, "Oh man, that's cool." I'm gonna draw a deer. Next another <laughs> deer all, all over the cave wall. And mom comes in and she's like, "Who drew on the wall? <laughs> Who drew all these deer?" <laughs> the oldest art in the world. Yeah, that's great. Those are, those those caves are amazing. I had a teacher one time that asked me why they thought why I thought those or no, he asked the classroom why we thought those paintings still existed in those caves. And the answer was like elements or something like that, or they didn't rain in there or whatever, you know, that's why they didn't wash away. But I was like, I don't know, those people were just in the caves and they had nothing better to do. They're probably in there wishing they could have that deer. <laughs> so they was, they drew a picture of a deer on the wall, started chewing on it, you know, or something. I don't know. Cave art. I never made cave art. But yeah, everybody, all the, all the ideas have to, it has to feed off the older ideas that came before. Even if it's an anti, like if it's, you know, it's like, kind of what Andy Warhol was doing was trying to be anti-artist, you know, and, and even if you're doing that, you're still, you're just feeding off another person, you know, for that another idea that fed you that, you know, and I don't know. I'm proud of who I am and the art that I make and I'm always going to, I'm never going to like cover my face or anything. I hope I don't have to. Uh, how do you feel about like um, the street art movement? Like, uh, like I get through the grift shop, that doc <laughs> and, and then that sort of stuff. Matt, yeah, dude, Banksy's genius. He's awesome. Like one person, a thousand people, ten people, me. I don't know who Banksy is, but um, I, 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 I um, it's does genius. he play bass for some bands or something? Right? What's that? I, I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's 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 a it's a it's a it's a crazy crazy idea. But he's genius. He got to figure it out. And he's he's the one. You know, there we go. We talk about like the artists that people that time will remember about right now. It's gonna be Banksy. You know, he's gonna be the yeah. one. No matter how many people you go out there, I mean, Shepard Fairey is amazing, but no matter how many people go out there and, and do what Banksy does or try to be Banksy or, or spray paint, he's the one that came up with that idea, you know, or at least marketed it right and got to the point of doing it correctly to where it had a statement as long as, as well as looking interesting. It also said something, you know, he's like, he's like, he's five years ahead of everybody else. I think it's just like, oh, of course. And, 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 I guess you can go back to street art and I think about like a lot of my early influences when I was drawing as a kid, cause I grew up in the, in the seventies and the eighties was, you know, hip hop. And, and, and whenever beat street came along, beat street wasn't about break dancing or rap music. It was about graffiti. Yeah. And that's, that was the beginning of the hip hop movement was all that graffiti art and what was going on in that create in that creative engine that started in the dance and hip hop and everything kind of grew out of all that. Um, so crazy street art, dope moves. Street street art for me goes all the way back to those burners, you know, and then people, you know, I don't I don't really like tagging so much as I do like people who are being really creative with it. Obviously, there's a difference, you know, you write your name with a pen or you, or you go out there and do a really beautiful, colorful mural with your name. You know, there's a difference. Um, I get it. I get it all, you know, but I don't want to be the guy. Like I said, I don't want to be the guy that ever has to hide his face. So I didn't do a whole lot of that. 
know, what's, what's the uh, what's the earliest piece of artwork that you created that you still have? Oh, I got a piece of art in the living room that's a painting from high school. So that'd be like 1990 or 89. And then the paintings, they started in about the ones I have still that kept. They, they started around 92 or 93, probably. Um, my mom's probably got stuff from when I was a kid. I'm sure there's there's stuff, there's drawings and stuff like that around. The first poster I made was in 1994. And it was for one of my buddy's bands. And I don't have a copy of it, but, I, but it's, it's there's a picture of it somewhere on the internet. I have seen it. <laughs> it hey, do, do you think do you think posters is what you're like like that where you can like that where you can knock out the quickest where you can sort of come up with the concept and because okay. I mean yeah, you seem yeah. to be prolific at it. I could do one in about if you know if it, if if it, if it's a hand drawn piece of artwork that goes into the the process of it all like that drawing I had earlier, you know the, the stuff because a lot of stuff I still do is by hand. It's all pen and ink and like I drew with pencil and then do pen and ink and then I scan that into the computer, color it apply that to the, the poster or the lettering, things like that. But it still is done by hand. But I mean, I can do one by hand in the, in the course of an afternoon, depending on the idea. If the idea is fresh enough, it works good. People are open to what my my, my um, conception will be. Then it usually works around just fine. Um, and it can, sometimes people will want to call me on the phone to talk about the poster. And while they're on the phone talking to me about the poster, I'll have the whole thing drawn out on a piece of paper on the desk. Or we're talking on the phone. And I was like, you really want to talk about this for 15 more minutes? Because I'm almost done. You know? <laughs> yeah, you, they're like, they're talking. Just something that I, I, posters was my original idea of like, how would I make my art commercial? And I saw the posters of punk rock in the 60s and those, and they were all being, you know, all the flyers. And every time you go to a city you like, we go to St. Louis, you'd see a poster for the bands that were coming to town. And I saw that and I wanted to do that. So posters have always been, always been woven into this whole process. The, no, the, the, you're talking to them on the phone uh, about the poster, and they're like, "Hey, I just got an email for you that says rough draft. What is this?" Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're moving. Like, get off the phone so I can finish it. <laughs> <laughs> no, the reason, um, you know, and, and the reason I, I, I wanted to, you know, um, get you on the on the podcast because, like I said, I used to do something that I'm a filmmaker, so I obviously I have access to talking to a shitload of actors and filmmakers and stuff like that. But I wanted to branch out and talk uh, to people in different walks of life and stuff that's interesting to me. So obviously as, you know, as an art nerd and, um, and as somebody who, who likes to follow independent artists, uh, I'm glad that you came, I'm glad that you, uh, that you had time to, to come talk. Cause I, uh, you know, like I guess I just want, like talking. I want to paint with Jim Carrey. Can you hook that up? What's up? I want to paint with Jim Carrey. Can you hook that up? <laughs> I will. Yeah. You know what? Let, let's, let's put that on the list. <laughs> I would love to paint with Jim Carrey. He's an awesome painter. Anyway. <laughs> Do you feel that, do, 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 you, do you like, I mean, like George Bush, Jim Curry, what do you feel about like some celebrities that all of a sudden get out there and put their work out there and start making money off it right away? Yeah, the making money off it right away, that feels like cheating to me. The artwork's good. <laughs> now, listen, I'm not going to lie. Jim Curry's art's really good. I mean, I, uh, the stuff that I've seen that he's done, and but he has access to this immense studio with these giant 12 foot canvases and, this, and, no, and time on his hands, no worries. Yeah, so the absolutely. Kind of, there's, there's definitely going to be my like my my like, old school punk rocker that's like, ah, you didn't live in the van long enough, you know, you can't you can't just jump out. But those guys, they they have that power. George Bush, his art's interesting. It's definitely good. Um, I guess some people in the in the in those positions, they end up with more time than they need, so that painting becomes a. I think everybody should paint. First of all, it's interesting to see the big celebrities do it and then make money. But that's just part of the process. And they maybe they won't be into it for very long. Who knows? I mean. Or maybe Jim Carrey will turn out to be a painter instead of an actor, and they'll look back and they'll say, he was really funny and did acting for a while, but then look at this yeah. art that came out of it. You know, it, it could be amazing. Like Ronald Reagan as president, they forgot about his, his crappy film work. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. That was, uh, uh, it was only during the campaign that they talked about that. <laughs> what is, so what do you miss the most of, like, pre-COVID? Is it just the being able to go to festivals and stuff like that? Yeah, I would spend my whole summer traveling all around the Midwest and doing festivals and we would do 10, 12 festivals a summer, and those are great weekends of just being out in the open with people. And I mean, I had to do all this art. Don't really have a gallery to put it in, so it ends up kind of being an online situation where people can see it online. But when you, I go out and set my stuff up, I prefer to do it that way where I'm setting my art up there, get to see me painting, they get to see the artwork right there, they can buy the artwork from me. Um, I miss that. I miss the interaction with people, of course. You, you know? got the music going on in the background. I miss the comfort of being in a crowd because I don't know that it's going to be comfortable anymore. <laughs> oh, hey. Yeah. That's a that's a deep that's a deep one right there. Yeah, 
because I you can't I can't feel comfortable at the damn Dollar General store. Let alone I'm gonna feel when 500 people are around me. Like I used to love. That used to be my favorite thing was to be in a, a big giant crowd with 500 people. You know, have a good time. Small room, big big, big field, whatever it was. And I think that's gonna be that's the hardest thing is gonna is gonna be able to find that comfort again. You know. But hey, not to be a downer, man, because because we're gonna figure it out. And no, no, yeah, yeah, I guess absolutely. I mean, and then and the and the good thing is that you know, number one, uh, everybody that has a job job. If your boss told you that that's not a kind of job that can be done from home, well, it turns out they were full of shit because there's no reason you can't work from home two, three days a week, even after this is all over, right? Yeah. Which means less clouded roadways. The earth got a little moment to chill out, you know, which is which is always good. And people have adapted to, uh, to you know, doing things more online. People are creating art. They're creating vlogs. Obviously, there's a, there's a lot of negative, too, that, that comes with it. Nobody's going to say that that's not true yeah. as well. But, but, you know, shit, you know, we as a species will adapt, you know, we'll uh, find a way as. Uh, I started doing different things. I tried to, you know, I didn't do as many concert posters. I didn't go to as many festivals this year. But I found that, that, you know, that time I'm always home anyway. I'm always in my studio. So it's getting more time to work. And a lot of my musician friends, honestly, they're like, they're kind of, they're, they're all being hurt by it. But a few of them I've talked to are benefiting from, you know, more time with their family on the weekends when they would never be with the family on the weekends. My one friend Chad is hanging out with his kids on a Friday afternoon, and they wouldn't get to do that half the Fridays if he was touring still. And so for right now, there's this little moment, this little bubble of time where, if we look at it right, we're getting those benefits to it. You know, we, we're we're closer than we are than we were before. I mean, it definitely slowed me down and made me made me think about things and take a different approach to what I how I was doing. I guess you know, got to like you said, we're humans, we adapt and. No, and I think there's a. There's a there's no going back to pre COVID life, but I think there's probably hopefully a happy medium between what we've learned so far and you know getting to do some of the fun stuff like you said, being around people, you know. Mm-hmm. Although I, I can't see myself sharing a joint with anybody anytime soon. It's just, you know everybody gets everybody gets their own. I'm sorry, you get a blunt, you get a blunt, everybody gets a blunt. I uh, you know I mean, let's let's just. Yeah. The session the sessions are, are done. Don't pass me no stinky bong full of fucking stale smoke either you know i don't that's that, that's fine yeah so you see there's, there's benefits to everything we'll figure it out and we're learning from it we're gonna we'll have like a and we're already washing our hands a lot more i mean yeah <laughs> it's gotta be like there's benefits to all of it you know in a sense and it's just, uh, yeah it's a, it's a good thing it's you know it's weird, it's, you know. When, did this, when did this guy come to you uh, what, what number is it uh this is words and lines the fifth That's a few years ago Okay, I'm not going anywhere. Go ahead. Um, that's the fifth one, yeah. There's seven all together. Actually, there's eight because there was a pre a pre one I did. And with these, what these boil down to, because these are just like they're books that I made because I had all these drawings. Some of them I did. This one I did intentionally. I did all the drawings for it, but this was not available, so you can't get that one. Sorry, this was not available either. I put these one away. They're not, well, not available. Not available. Not available. But the last three I have a few left of. Um, what they are, though, they're just um, like, so I have stacks of drawings. They're like, there's a stack two inches thick of black and white drawings on my on my desk here. And I was able to take all those drawings and just put them into book form. And really, like, if you had all seven books, you'd have almost every black and white drawing that I liked for like 15, 20 years of drawings and stuff. Because then they're all, and, and these ones, some of these have, um, the ones you have has some song lyrics in it too, because I work with musicians. And then some of them are just just imagery, you know, just drawings. And that is that's Hunter S. Terrapin there, as you were noticing there on the cover. Right? <laughs> yeah, I love that one. Hunter S. Terrapin. Dude, yeah, um, I just came out with number seven, which I think I got right. Here. Well, I don't even have it here. Never mind. Yeah. The um. No, and that's number seven. <laughs> oh, nice. And that's and that one that another collaboration with musicians that I worked with and the different and some songs they did with the artwork. And if there's song in there, there's artwork or lyrics in there and drawings, it means I've done posters for them and and designed for them in the past or drawn for them in the past. The um, can you paint without music? Yeah, I prefer to have some music on. The whole live going live on Facebook is kind of frustrating because they don't want you to play anything that's owned by anybody. Or they'll mute you or cut your video off. I've had the video taken down before because of the background music. And, and I know I'm trying, I was careful about it. And I even went to bands 
And they were all like, yeah, you can use my music, but they don't even know who owns their music. The people that are saying you can use our music in the background of your video, they don't even know who, you know, who owns their music. So I'm getting pinched for music they said I could use. So I, yeah, I, I love listening to music. Though. I have music all the time. And if I paint, there's probably some kind of music on for sure or a video or something, depending on what I'm painting. I painted Kurt Vonnegut one time and I did listen to books on tape while I painted him. <laughs> it's good. What is, what, is, what, is, uh, what is next for you artistically? Are you happy kind of with the canvases that you're doing now? Are you going to explore different spaces? Are you, you going to move on to those Jim Carrey size giant ass canvases? What, what, is, yeah. what, no what, what pulls you? I got no room or market for those big ones. I wish I, if I could, I would, but I don't have a market for it. Um, right. I, I just, every, every, every week is something, something changes or is different. Like I did these like last week and these were these kind of experiments with color. They were just kind of like these floral queer, crazy arrangements of light and color. But it's, I don't know. That's just what I did last. And like, but then I painted a dog this week too. And this is Stanley, otherwise known as Robert plant. Um, nice. I'm painting on this this record album cover back here where I've got this Sonic Youth record and I'm using the I'm cleaning my brushes off on it so that the record itself will be kind of a painting. I don't know. I don't know what's next. I'll just see what happens tomorrow. I think the next project is actually a picture of Ferdinand the Bull. If you know who that is. Absolutely. So Ferdinand the Bull is a piece of art that's coming up. It's on the next one of the next paintings on the list. And that should just be a, a bull on a hilltop with the smelling flowers under a tree. Yeah. Um but yeah, so I don't know. I don't know. And I just, and I'll just kind of be experimenting as I go and see what happens. And if people like it, I'll keep doing it. If they don't like it, I'll probably keep doing it for a little while. <laughs> How disappointed were you that you couldn't go to a Cardinals game and yell at the Astros this year? Yeah, I haven't gone for a couple of years, unfortunately. I haven't gone? Uh, we, I, I, yeah, I haven't been for a couple of years. The kids got older, and we just we kind of stopped going, unfortunately. And I want to go. I love it. I love it. That's my favorite way to experience a baseball game is go sit there in the, in the, in the field and I'm like, you know, and stands and watch it. Um, used to work for a place that had you know, season tickets. And I was real lucky for a while. I got to go to a bunch of games. And then I, they gave me some tickets one time, and I gave them to my father-in-law because it was a Giants game, and he's from San Francisco. It's like, man, he's got to go to this game. You know, I don't want to go see. I can't even make it, so I gave these two tickets to my father-in-law. And then the next meeting, they were talking about the tickets. They said that nobody could give tickets to anybody else. They had to use them themselves. And I never got offered tickets again. Oh, wow. You got busted. <laughs> Yeah. And I was like, dude, I didn't like sell him the tickets or something, you know, I gave them to him, you know, it wasn't like I was trying to make profit off of it. He loves the Giants, man. You know, but I, get to, I get to go to the whenever I, I go to I go to the whole series whenever the Mets come out to play the Padres. That's my own thing. But but I try to catch as many baseball games as possible. I love I can pretty much listen to if there's nothing else on the radio, but there's a baseball game broadcast, even if it's a team that I don't like, you know, I'd rather listen to that than just music that I don't like in some cases. There's something about the sounds of a, of a, of a radio baseball game that get me. Yeah. They're not blacked out in your area or something. We get, dang it. I love, I love my baseball. Yeah. We, we, like I said, I'm, I live basically right between St. Louis and Chicago. So you got a really good line of people that a good rivalry here, you know, that's the red and blue state. We are like, it, it is literally drawn right down the middle of my town. There's a lot of there's a lot of mixing in that area because like I know that my sister lives in Indiana but they're so close to Chicago that they consider themselves people from Chicago, and well, then there's people. Yeah, and I get I get a lot of crap for being from Illinois and like the Cardinals. Right. I mean, like, we just grew up going to St. Louis and all the concerts I went to when I was a kid were in St. Louis. There's always great music and art. And, I mean things. So we we never had you know anyway, I get crap for it, but I still like them. I can't I can't switch you know now. Yeah. Uh, do you uh, when you're not painting when you're not creating or uh, what do you what do you binge or what what besides music what what kind of stuff are you into? Oh man, I, I don't like. Yeah, probably. Like, I don't want, I like I like TV. Like we're watching a bunch of crap right now. We're watching like seventeen shows right now. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know? I don't like them all, but I gotta finish them. You know? No, yeah, like, yeah. You already like, committed. Oh, I, I, I like it depends on the night. Like some nights we'll be watching some some Chicago PD or something or some Chicago Fire, and then some nights okay. I'll be watching art documentaries on YouTube. I get sucked down that rabbit hole. Yeah. Lately, I got sucked into the top ten list rabbit hole on YouTube, and it just like it's about had the about had the enemy last month or so. The top I think, ten I think impress I, the top ten impressionist of all times. Oh, just top ten funny Saturday Night Live skits. Top ten oh, okay. people who did oh, this. Man. Top ten just really bad stuff. Oh man, I don't know yeah. how you get started on it. And next thing you know. 
if I started watching like top 10 great movie acting parts or something, I was like, it's really inspiring to make you want to watch all these movies, you know? And then none of them are available for free. You got to buy them all. I don't know. I, I do a lot of art. I, I, I'm pretty busy with the artwork. It keeps me pretty busy. And then my kids, my family, my wife, the cats, the dogs, things like that, you know, which I don't have any dog anymore. But, um, you know, the wife and family are most important, but art is, um, art keeps me pretty busy. Yeah. Hey, any any top ten artist roles in movies that doesn't end with Jeffrey Wright and Basquiat as number one is invalid for me, man. Because he's. Oh, I agree. I agree. Uh, although I really want to see the new um, Willem Dafoe as Vincent Van Gogh movie. I haven't seen that yet. Yeah. The the um. Did you ever see what's this guy the 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 Jackson Pollock movie with uh, Ed Harris? Oh yeah, with Ed, with Ed Harris in it. Yeah, that was good. I like anything art related like that. The Frida Gallo movie, all of it. Um. Like I said, the one that, that that one that's um oh there's a good newer, good Frank Zappa documentary coming out, but um no that, that, anytime that the arts portrayed in the movie and you talk about it and they they teach they teach about the history, I think it's important, you know, regardless of the outcome. I mean I guess the the what is it like a, the Rothko, which is just the, the plain color paintings, like the stuff like that. That's that's yeah. kind of where it it, it, start, it begins to lose me where it's just sort of art that's just that just wants to say it's art and then have you just accept it you know i'm reading a book right now called bluebeard it's by kurt vonnegut actually and it's um it's about that time period about those artists and why they did what they did and it's uh yeah it's not it doesn't make you respect them anymore than, they, <laughs> than you do when you look at the art they were in it for the money and then there was a, a it was there again that was another anti-art movement that was trying to to take all the art away and you know like you know kind of like banksy shredding his thing you know it's like this is like yeah. a, it's a it's but it's a statement and, and and listen we wouldn't still be talking about it if it wasn't important in our history you know rothko wouldn't be like you know he can do a blue and yellow stripe but for some reason 20 years later it's still selling they're still talking about it it still was a chunk in our history where they say this happened you know and and, and you have to acknowledge that as part of the the adventure of artwork you know i don't well, understand I, i'm gonna, I'm gonna See, I don't quite get it, you know. I, but the idea that um, some people really get something out of it, and those are the people. Maybe they're anti-art fans. I'm not sure how that works, you know. Do you ever get um? Do you ever get any negative reaction from your style? Does any? I mean, because everything that I see mostly is is positive about people liking your art. But does any? Do you ever get any shit for for any reason? No, no. The only time that I ever got any kind of garbage was from people who was like telling me their kid can do it or that. Oh yeah. It's worth what I'm not, you know, and I don't charge that much for my paintings, but people will still come up and, and, and I was doing this great big painting of a tree. It's like 24 by 36, this festival. And it was really turned out nice. And so I started to ask people, you know, they were like, what do you sell for? I was like, well, what do you think it's worth? And they were saying like 30 bucks, you know, 40 bucks, you know, and it's like, I get it. You know, I, and then, then I know what market I'm in right away, you know, but even, I don't even go higher than a few hundred bucks if I don't have to for a painting. I kind of I have this theory about being able to relate to the people who get who get to enjoy my art, and if you got six thousand dollars to spend on a painting, I probably can't relate to you. And I think that there's, I mean, I know that's fine. Don't get me wrong. I'll sell you. You want to buy it? Six thousand? That's fine. But but I don't know that I'm going to be as relatable with that person as the person who can give me a few hundred bucks for it and that really gets so much out of it. And you can tell what the, what's coming out of their life, what, what they're what they're you know, you can tell they want it. If they're going to give you that amount of money, they don't have a lot. I mean, anyway, it just. I want to be able to relate to people I sell my art to. So it's always going to be somewhat in, in a reasonable range. I don't have a gallery to put in. I'm not in a city. I'm definitely not in a cultural Mecca of any kind. The town here, they don't, they do not support my artwork whatsoever, but you know, I have to travel or I have to be online to make, to make it work. You know? Well, I mean, similar to how filmmakers kind of have the, 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 the playing field level then is that I can get the same basic camera or rent the same camera package that they make any Hollywood movie with. And if I, if I, if my eye is good and my story is good and my actors are good, I can make the same product that they make. So for filmmakers and for indie filmmakers, if they have talent and, and it doesn't matter where they are, because talent will rise and people will recognize talent when they see it. Um, so I think, you know, in a sense, you know, it's also been leveled since there's, the online marketplace is so huge where if, if, if the right people share your pictures or more people get up, you know, the more and more people that follow you and see your work, you're going to develop your own family. You don't have to be in New York or Paris to right. to to do that. And and, and, and I was going to ask you, like, well, how do you feel when like those like uh, junior reporters have their daughter or their four year old kid make a bunch of drawings and then they put it up in an art gallery next to other like expose. 
my four-year-old's drawings are like, mm-hmm. can you tell which one is the Pollock and which one is me just dripping right. paint? Absolutely. You know why? Because I stood in front of a Jackson Pollock and they are fucking humongous. And if you stand out and if you stand right up to it like this, you don't get it. But then you have to like back away slowly and just sort of sit there and take it in and you'll get it. You'll get something out of it. I can't tell you what you're going to get, but it's definitely not just sitting there dripping fucking paint everywhere, you know? Yeah. And not not every art, not not every kind of art for every person. And obviously, I mean, I mean, people are going to I mean, there's always going to people that turn their nose up to it. But those people don't generally walk up to the wall and look at it, you know, either. They're not going to spend the time with you to talk about it. I feel like the world is is way more positive than negative. The people that I talk to on a daily basis, my artwork is positive. It's, it's bright, it's colorful, but I, I get way more positivity. You know, and you you know, even with my poster work, I might do a couple hundred posters in the course of a year, and if you know, one of them or two of them will be unhappy with the design or whatever, and it'll turn out to be an uncomfortable situation. Now, as an artist, that can crush you just as much as anything. You know, no matter how many projects you have, somebody doesn't like one of them, you definitely don't forget that experience, you know. But people will come and say, I could do that, or I could I could get that, or, I, you know, you say, I could get the camera, they could say, that I could, I could make that movie, or I could do this or that, you know. But will they? No. Because <laughs> they don't, they don't get, they're not an artist, man. They're not they an artist. Have the drive. Like I said, you got to have that drive to, to produce and to create and to do it, you know. And if you, anyway, you're sure anybody could paint these paintings. Go for it. I'll show you how to do it. If they come up and say their kid could do it and their kids stand there, I'm like, sweet. And I'll have a hour, half hour conversation with their kid about how they should be making art. You know, There's a whole bunch of generation of people that grew up when they stayed home sick from school watching this guy paint, and they all thought that if they had the fucking uh, the fan brush and the thing that they could sit there and grab a canvas and, and make happy little trees and do it. He made it look so easy, but it's not that fucking easy. Yeah, I bet no. you, I bet you, I bet you, out of the million people that tried a Bob Ross painting, less than one percent was happy with what they did at the end and then probably about 90 85 percent probably just was like ah, i'm done i'm not i'm not a painting's not for me so not everybody has to be an artist or you know but i think that 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 obviously during a pandemic during covid when people are binging shows looking for art looking for stuff to do um you we, hopefully another thing that comes out of it is that the role that artists play in society and how important they are and how you shouldn't belittle them or say, what are you going to do for money? There should be a place for artists to be able to make money doing what they love. Right. Yep. And if At you do it right, you, can, you know, if you're good, if you're good to people and you, and you share what you do and you, and you sometimes being an artist, the hardest part is just saying, I, I made it saying, here it is. I made it. What do you think? You know, cause that's where people stop. Almost everybody stops right there. Oh, I paint, I paint, I do art, but I could never paint live like you do. They say, I could never get my art out in front, you know, for, for sale. You know, like, well, that is the hardest step is saying, I made it. Here it is. What do you think? And then, you know, that's the only way you're going to get that reaction. That's the only way you're going to sell something or you're going to want to progress, you know, and sometimes, and then once you start to sell things, that will actually drive you to want to produce more. You see what people like and it will direct your, your, you know, if I'm not saying I'm doing this for the money, but it does help to have that motivation and that, you know, people say they like something. I, otherwise I just end up with a big stack of paintings and I just stop painting because they're just sitting around. I don't want to do with them. So, you know, do, do you um, do you mostly because I know you, you've painted celebrities kind of like the dogs, but uh, do you do you do like more personal stuff like paintings of your family, self portraits, stuff like that that you don't sell or show? Um, yeah, I do a lot of personal stuff, um, but then I, I try to sell everything. You know, I try to get. Oh, okay. you know, I, uh, I see my, my whole progression of all my stuff, and like I look around the house, and I've collected pieces from during periods of my art, and I don't have any other pieces, but there are other places. Um, but then I do like, you know, it, I, it doesn't have to be like a celebrity or something. You know, it can be a custom picture of somebody's grandma or, you know, I, I, I draw pictures for the wife every now and then. I used to do more, but I don't do as much as I used to. But, um, you know, I, I, I try to and everything I do is personal. To be, like, especially the stuff like you see behind me is, is all kind of my experimental stuff that I'm doing. That's always personal to me until somebody else finds personal attachment to it. You know, and then then that becomes then if they want to take it, have it or whatever it goes their direction. But um, so let's say like 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 the, the the painting right over your shoulder, like you know you you the other the other one the uh the Jerry, uh yeah. So I mean, you have it there. Obviously, you you, you like it, but 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 you're never afraid to ha- give that to somebody because you always know you can recreate. Are you afraid? Are you ever afraid that you won't be able to recreate the exact same one? No, yeah. no, no not, they never will be the same one. 
No, and, and when I first started painting, I wouldn't sell anything. I had some guy when I was really young offer me like a thousand dollars. He was some crazy drug dealer or something. You want to give me a thousand dollars for this painting? And I said no, and it's still hanging in my living room. But there was a certain point where everything is kind of for sale because I don't want to store it. I don't need to look at it. Like it's not a catalog I want to look at and look through. It's a, I already had the process. I already had the experience of doing it. I learned while I was making it. So the next piece will be different. And if I go back too far, like there's a few paintings around that have been around for a while that are just kind of like, they'll stick around. But I don't have any, there's no attachment as far as like the, the, the art goes. There's always, I always make more art, you know, and I, Actually, I, had, I don't know if you remember um, a couple of years ago, I had, there was a fire and I had like 31 right. paintings burnt up. The so 31 paintings burnt up in a gallery that I had my art in. It was a sold abandoned building, essentially, but we had set up like an art gallery and it burned down. Anyway, you, and some artists that were in there had their art that they'd been working on and they'd been holding on to since high school. And, and, and some of them had stuff that they were ne that was not for sale because they would never sell it because it was their, you know, and some people are attached to their art when they make it like that. They want to make it and it's their experience, you know, and then they, they can't let it go. But once you get to a point where you can let it go, I mean, obviously it becomes kind of a business. You know, I, I make a few sales off of it each year, you know, it works out. It keeps me, keeps me busy enough. Um, I always pay more Jerry's. That's, that's, that's something I've got in my brain now. I just pay over and over again, probably have to. And there's usually always one of those around, but they always change. They're always a little different, you know, I might use blue and white for a while. And now I'm using all the primary colors to mix on the canvas and like, it, but then now this new thing I'm doing is all the different colors again. So I'm just going, I don't really have any rules to it. You know, I'm just going to paint with my hands and then whatever comes out of that will be what I do. You know? um, it's fucking, that's fucking dope. No, just because, because like I said, there's, there are certain, like the only time I'll make something is if when I, like, for example, I, the, the piece that I had that exhibited at uh, in San Diego, I, when I made that, I was like, Oh, this is, I'm going to give this to my mom when I'm done, you know, because she's always been so supportive yeah. And then, you know, they're like, uh, well, they, I think after the show, I got offered 10 grand for it. And I was like, uh, no, <laughs> sorry. I, I, it's, it's, That's it's for, my, lesson, isn't it? right there. I, for a minute. And, I, and, and, my, and my mom was like, what are you stupid? And I was like, no, it's, I, I said, I said it was yours. Was like you can sell it to him, but I'm not, I'm not selling it to him. I, you know, um, but I, I, but yeah, but there's a difference between making the art and then just having to hold on to it because of what it, I guess it could mean to you versus, you know, that's why I think you probably would have fit in good in the eighties and nineties with, with those guys, they were making, you know, once they, once they drew the picture on the wall, it wasn't theirs anymore. They had sort of given it up into, you know, into the world. Right. And sometimes a painting won't sell for a while. Then it becomes more important to me and I don't want to sell. Like okay. Anything. I have off the wall right here. It's like this is a painting, this picture of Kurt Cobain like years ago. And then they never sell. And then I ripped the hole in it one time and I was doing moving some stuff around. But then I don't I don't want to sell it. Now it's just it's mine. It's part of the it's part of the gallery wall now. You can't, you know, I can't. Um if I, if you fin if you finish a painting and you're not happy with it, do you just paint over it and make something else with it? Do you trash it immediately? Or do you, you know, what do you do? Like if you're just right. not happy with the result. I'm not happy with any painting I do ever during every single painting I do. There's always a period of every painting yeah. and drawing and idea where I don't like it. Um, and you have to just took, push past that. It took me a long time to stop throwing stuff away. Stop wow. quitting, stop giving up, stop. Uh, you know, I try a medium. I didn't like it. So I would just like set it aside and never go back to it. Or I do drawings that I didn't like halfway through. I throw them away. And then, I kept making these same stupid mistakes that I felt that with my, you know, see drawing my black and white lines, my lines weren't consistent. They were thick and thin and they were having all these problems. But until I realized that that's just how I drew or painted and I had to keep going, there was a point where like everything was garbage. And then all of a sudden the one piece I worked a little harder on and there was a reward because if you work past that point of, of frustration and this can go for a college course, a movie, anything you're doing in your life, there's always going to be a point of frustration where you don't know if it's going to work. You don't like it and you can give up. But if you keep pushing and you go a little bit further with every piece, with every drawing, with every idea, you'll find it, it'll find its way back. And I've, I've, I had one, which is like the infamous painting of Neil Young, I did for my dad that I just hated. And I hated it. I hated it. Like I hated it like 10, 12 times. 
and I kept painting it and messing it up and painting it and messing it up. And I'd step out of the room and come back to the room and it wasn't him. It was just, that's why I stopped doing portraits partially because these, the frustrations of the, 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 the strict, you know, the strict rules of a portrait. And, um, but I found a way through it eventually. I think every, every painting or drawing I do, there's a point where I don't like it. And I, I try really hard not to get rid of anything or waste material or, or, um, and I really, I really try hard not to, um, not to get to that point with any piece of art where I, I'm so unhappy with it. And there's, I mean, I've had to go back and, you know, repaint things, change things, paint out the eyes. Oh, I've painted out more eyes than any other feature on any painting. But eventually you get to that point where you're happy with it. And I think that's just, that's, that's kind of something you can probably apply to life in general. You know, you're at the grocery store and you're walking to the fucking grocery store right now and you're doing good. And then you get about half to the grocery store and you realize you got to, you know, you got to call somebody or do a text. And then you realize you're in your mask in the grocery store. How long do I have in this mask in the grocery store? Can I do it? You know, and you fight through it and you get through it and you get out to your car and your groceries and you're done. You, and that's your reward. But every painting, every drawing, every project I work on, it seems like there's some frustration that, that almost pushes you to the brink of not wanting to do it anymore. But I've gotten to the point where I just, I go past that. If that makes, if that answers your question, I'm not sure. Um, no, I man, I'm not. With that, I guess. Because I, I, and if, it, if it, it, until I start realizing that my mistakes were my style, you know, like it, it, you, everybody makes mistakes. Not bad mistakes, obviously, but when you're drawing, it's a, it's a mistake of your hand. But until you realize that that's just how your hand works and you accept your mistakes, and you really never find your own style. And then you, only, you don't find your own style until you accept those mistakes. And then your mistakes actually are what become your original, your originality. You know, because nobody's going to make the mistakes the same way you make them. But you got to continue to make those mistakes so they're repetitive and there's nice balance. <laughs> no, man, I, 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 uh, I appreciate your, your style and your outlook on it a lot, man. And I think, you know, like, like your, your style is, is both old school, but modern. And I think that it's uniquely geared towards you to tour. I mean, there's, like I said, there's, there's like, like, for example, my brother who actually, who's, a uh, who's, um, is actually opening up a, a tattoo shop in, uh, Troy, Missouri. So he's, he's over there in, uh, in that Missouri area, uh, is a very gifted technical artist. Technically he is incredibly proficient and in as he can, he can, he can draw like almost a photorealistic, uh, photorealistic sort of, um, sort of, you know, he's a tattoo artist and stuff. He's done all my, my arm and stuff. Like he's, he's incredibly talented, but I don't, wouldn't put him in a category of in terms of like a creative. So you can, you can have somebody that's technically talented in being able to create art, digital art, tattoo art, etc. And then there's people that might not have the elite technical pristine ability, like the masters have of just the perfect recreation of faces, but their style and 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 their vision of 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 that face kind of compensates for that and gives it an, a, a different kind of artistic feel at least that's kind of how i always felt about it so i i really appreciate and i like you know your style so obviously even though at the time um like i was like i was like no man i need somebody to draw me a picture of a burrito and then i see all your posters and stuff did and i'm like burrito? did i draw a burrito <laughs> Did I draw one? I no, no, no. We, I never got to that point. I was like, I was like, I don't know if this is the guy that that I want to draw my two AM burrito and stuff. But I was yeah, like, it but, would be like on page seven of like book three <laughs> or something somewhere. Somewhere, right? Um, but like I said, I, I was really um, drawn to to kind of your style, and then just having talked to you and, and having bought some of your art and stuff, I just kind of always, uh, you know, thought you were like, you know, like a cool dude. And talking to you now, which I'm glad we got a chance to do, you have a real, you know, bright outlook, positive. Um, and just sort of answered some of my questions about art and stuff in a, in a, in a, in a way that I didn't, that I hadn't thought about for a while since I've sort of been separate. I haven't, I haven't done art. I have a shit ton of canvases in, in, in my, in my area and paints and everything, but I, I haven't drawn or done anything creative like that because I focus so much on my film art, you know? Yeah. Um, but it's, uh, but it's, you know, but I appreciate, uh, you know what I'm saying? I appreciate your art. I like your style, man. And, and it was, and, and I, I'm glad that I got a chance to just talk about art with you. You just said about your film art and then what you focus on and what in that Bobby Out movie says, what are you, a painter or a musician? <laughs> exactly. You have, right. to, you have to you have to put yourself yeah. in the hole. Yeah, that's you know, there's yeah. I love art as a hobby and the two things that I'm that I'm the most passionate and uh that I'm really good at is uh poker and making movies. And like if I put if I put all the effort that I you know, because I grew up watching my, my dad play poker from when I was like six years old, so 
I've been a degenerate gambler since I was born. Um, yeah, poker movie in you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but but when I play too much poker, I focus less on my filmmaking. And and like you said, you know, what are you what are you a musician or a or a, or a painter? That 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 that. There's so many. There's so much truth in that movie. <laughs> So there much. Is, it's yeah. it's such a good movie for any type of artist, man, because it can just it can change how you feel. Like like I remember there was like a depressed time when I would just watch that movie every fucking day. And when he's uh, when that stop motion movie and that song like Midway, you know, where he's sitting there. Uh, um, what is that? Uh, a Beck song or, or what have you? Uh, oh. That. Uh, yeah. Right at the beginning, whenever he just he sees that the, the sky is a wave. Yeah, 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 absolutely. The surfers, the surfers wave it's coming down the wave in the city. Yeah. The city. Yeah. You know, sometimes my skies end up with a wave in them. He, he's very insp inspirational for sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, so that's it. Yeah, we could have done we could have done an hour pod just on that movie, actually. So. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, um, for more information and for more uh, John Griffin Artman, uh, if you're on Facebook watching us, make sure you, sh you throw him a like and check out his stuff at John Griffin Art. Um, like I said, that was fucking super easy for me to order this book from him, and 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 I and I have it up as part of my artwork. That's a cool one. That's that's a dope one. Um, and you can follow him on uh, on Instagram at on John Griffin Art. My name is Lou Martinez, Big Chief Burrito. Make sure you follow us on Facebook.com, 2am Burrito, Twitch.tv, 2am Burrito, YouTube.time, blah, 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 blah. And the pod goes on audio only on BigChiefBurrito.podbean.com for my audio file friends that like to listen to us on the run. John. Hey, Lewis, thank you. I uh, I appreciate you, man. Uh, I'm I wish you nothing but the uh, but luck uh, going through this. I I do want to talk to you about 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 something after the the stream. So hang around for a second. Uh, <laughs> but but thank you for uh, for being on the show today. Yeah. Uh, thank you everybody for watching. And this is Big Cheap Burrito, John Griffin, from all the way from uh, Peace out. <laughs>